Good day, everybody. This is Chris with The Ancient Scholar. I hope this finds you all doing well. So today what I'm going to be talking about is mycotoxicity, approaching mushroom poisoning in the clinical environment. This is a rather fascinating and somewhat esoteric uh, subject in the field of pharmacology and pharmaceutical sciences, including toxicology. But I still find it to be really, really interesting, and uh, I'd like to take a little time to talk about this subject. Okay, conflicts of interest. I have nothing to declare, and uh, I also like to uh, preamble this by uh, stating that there are several pictures used in this presentation. These pictures um, have been primarily obtained through Wikipedia under a Creative Commons license, and I'm using them for educational, non-monetized uh, content. Um, I will, at the end of the presentation, uh, reference the links where these particular images can be found. In addition to that, I want to say that I have relied heavily upon one particular publication, and the format of that publication is uh, somewhat repl replicated in this presentation, and I want to give that particular publication some special note because I think it is so important and so relevant to uh, mycotoxicity, and that is an article that can be found in the Journal of American Board of Family Practice. It was published in 1994 under the name uh, Clinical Approach to Toxic Mushroom Poisoning. Even, even today, it is very relevant, it is very good information, and I strongly suggest uh, obtaining it and reading it if mycotoxicity is at all of interesting to you. Okay, without further preamble, let's go ahead and get into the presentation. So the objectives I'd like to cover today are uh, include the following. Identify signs and symptoms of commonly encountered mycotoxins. Identify appropriate treatment strategies for mycotoxin exposure. And then identify resources for obtaining clinical guidance and additional information uh, when it comes to uh, treating somebody who may be uh, suffering from a specific type or multiple types of mycotoxicity. All right, so let's talk about basic mushroom terminology. So first and foremost, this is not a course in myco uh, mycology in general, and so we're not going to be talking about how to identify specific kinds of mushroom mushrooms. And in fact, it's a very complicated. Uh, field and it generally have to be a mycologist or an expert to really get into the nitty-gritty of um, identifying specific mushrooms and it often involves taking the mushrooms and getting spore prints and doing doing uh, analytical uh, procedures that are really beyond this discussion but it is very helpful to understand the basic terminology that's used when talking about mushrooms, and I think that's really important. So mushrooms, of course, are a manifestation of a fungi, of a fungus, and a fungus has, throughout its life, it can take different forms, spores and mycelium, and then the mushrooms are kind of the one of the more common manifestations of the, the life cycle of, of fungus, and so um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So you see this picture here of a of a particular type of mushroom called an Amanita muscaria, which is kind of the classic uh, classic mushroom that many of us think. This red mushroom with these little spots on top of it. Uh, so I just included a picture of that, and then I drew some some basic uh, some I drew on top of that just some basic components of that mushroom, and and and. These components are not necessarily specific to this mushroom. Many mushrooms share these same features. And so on the very top of the mushroom, um, you have what's called a cap. And occasionally that cap can have what are called scales on it. And so in this particular mushroom, you see these little white spots. Where these are called scales. Not all mushrooms are going to have those scales. And then on the under surface of the cap, you have these, these little convolutions that are called gills because they literally look like gills. And typically what you have is from those gills, um, little, um, little spores can fall out of those gills. And sometimes the way that those spores fall and the patterns that those spores make when they fall are what are known as spore prints. And uh, those 
spore prints can be unique to specific species of mushroom and are very important when it comes to identifying and it is actually those spores that um, mushrooms uh, mushrooms you use those spores as a way of reproducing um, and then underneath uh, that you have what's called a ring underneath the gills or the cap you have a ring also known as an annulus and a stalk and then at the very uh, bottom toward the ground or in sometimes toward a tree often mushrooms come out of the ground or they come out of dead or rotting trees or sometimes they come out of um, uh, fecal matter particularly in the case of say uh, cows um, cow pies uh, and so on um, you have what's called the vulva or the veil remnant and essentially what happens is when a mushroom first comes out um, it, it, it kind, of, kind of comes out in this little circular object called a, a veil and then the stalk emerges from that veil and the veil kind of separates and so you have an upper part um, which becomes the ring or the annulus and the bottom part which becomes a veil remnant and then the cap comes out of that. Okay, so that's just basic mushroom terminology. Let's actually get into the toxic, the toxicological implications of these. Okay, so there are literally thousands of mushroom species in North America alone, and about a hundred or so of those are, are, are toxic to humans, are particularly toxic. And to, to make it simple, I don't want to talk about specific toxic mushrooms, but rather I want to talk about categories or syndromes of mycotoxicity and the toxins that these mushrooms produce, these so-called mycotoxins, really fall into seven broad or general categories. And in so no particular order, uh, let's just go ahead and review them. And then we will take a deeper dive into each of the seven categories. So the first category are what we call the cyclopeptides. Um, and these are also uh, often referred to as amanidin, which is one of the most common, uh, commonly encountered cyclo cyclopeptides. Uh, the second category is uh, a toxin called gyrometrin, uh, which is very similar to monomethylhydrazine uh, in the way that it impacts the central nervous system. Um, so it produces uh, hydrazine or monomethylhydrazine-like effects. The third category are, uh, is uh, what we call caprine. Um, caprine toxicity manifests primarily as a disulfram-like effect. Uh, the fourth category is what we call muscarin toxicity and uh, muscarin is a parasympathetic or a parasympathomimetic agent that produces cholinergic effects and so this this will produce a classic cholinergic toxidrome. Uh, the fifth major uh, category or includes uh, well really includes two toxins but they essentially manifest have the same manifestations even though they are a little different and these include uh, both ibotenic acid and muscimol. Now, it is very important to understand that muscimol is not the same thing as muscarin. In fact, the uh, effects are very different, so do not confuse those. So ibotenic acid and muscimol are very different in, in terms of their toxicological implications uh, than muscarin. And then um, we have, of course, a psilocybin, which uh, is very common in so-called magic, quote-unquote, magic mushrooms. Uh, psilocybin, of course, is a prodrug, and it is actually metabolized into its active form, psilocin. Essentially, you have a phosphate group that gets cleaved off to psilocybin to metabolize it into its active metabolite, psilocin. And then the last of the major syndromes are just the gastrointestinal irritants. Um, and these are a variety of mycotoxins that uh, tend to just cause gastrointestinal irritation. Okay, so just to emphasize, it is not as important to identify the exact species of mushroom involved, but rather what we want to do is we want to focus on the history the signs and symptoms, and the chyme course, as this will help determine the class of toxin involved and be our best guide for treatment. So it, we don't want to identify the exact mushroom because that's so nuanced that it's really going to be beyond what most of us 
uh, most of our expertise, most of us are going to be capable of doing. But what we want to do is we rather we want to find out which of these seven categories this patient falls into. So this is very much like the concept of a classic toxidrome when we talks about, talk about um, toxicology. This is a, a mycodrome, perhaps, a new word that I can coin, a mycodrome. So which of the seven microdromes are we dealing with? All right. So important questions to ask when we are working up a patient with suspected mycotoxicity. First of all, when were the mushrooms eaten, right? And when did symptoms begin? The time course is a critical thing to try to figure out in the setting of mycotoxicity. It's absolutely critical to get some sort of time course. Uh, so when were the mushrooms eaten? When did symptoms begin? How many kinds of mushrooms were ingested? Right? Was this a, a poly mushroom ingestion or poly mushroom toxic, uh, toxicity? When were the initial symptoms? Right? Again, time course is critical here. Was an ethanol containing beverage co ingested or ingested within three days of the mushroom ingestion? Um, this is going to be important because one of the seven mycodromes, I just love that word, I just came up with that, it's amazing. Uh, one of the seven mycodromes is going to uh, be intimately intimately related to uh, ethanol co-ingestion. Did anyone in, else ingest the mushrooms and did they develop symptoms, right? If you have multiple people with the same symptoms following the same ingestion, that is much more powerful, a much more powerful indication that we are dealing with a legitimate mycodrome. And then always remember that poison control can and really should be used as a resource. And of course, the number for poison control is 1-800-222-1222. All right, so let's dig into the seven classes, uh, starting with the cyclopeptides, the aminidin. So aminidin is an eight amino acid ring-shaped polypeptide, hence the term cyclopeptide. So aminidin is a type of cyclopeptide. And it generally works by inhibiting transcription. So if you remember back to uh, biology, right, for uh, if a cell needs to create a protein, the DNA within the cell is copied, right? And uh, that copy is then um, what we call uh, transcribed into messenger RNA. So DNA is... Uh, transcribed into messenger RNA, and then the messenger RNA leaves the nucleus, goes along the rough endoplasmic reticulum where it encounters ribosomes, and the ribosomes trans, uh, they, they, they transcribe that, or rather translate that into um, protein, right? And, and so the way aminidin works, roughly, is it inhibits transcription, which blocks messenger RNA production. So DNA cannot become transcribed into messenger RNA, and if you can't make messenger RNA or mRNA, then it cannot be translated into proteins via ribosomes in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so this essentially inhibits cellular protein synthesis. And so what do we see here? So if you ingest something that inhibits cellular protein synthesis, well, that inhibition is primarily going to involve organs that are coming into contact with high levels of aminidin, and of course, these typically are going to be the gastrointestinal organs because that's where you're gonna have the highest levels of aminidin following ingestion. Um, so you're going to have gastrointestinal organ dysfunction. The liver, the gut, the, the intestines, the pancreas and the kidneys are the most severely impacted organs, and, and even though we're not gonna talk, focus on specific mushrooms, I just wanna mention uh, some uh, for each of these, uh, each of these seven mm, mycotoxicity syndromes or mycodromes, um, I want to mention uh, characteristic uh, examples of fungi that can be problematic. And in this particular one, the, the the most common one that we reference is something called Amanita phalates. This is also known as the death cap. Uh, this is a very severe uh, uh, mycotoxicity. Uh, so it can, cyclopeptide or aminidin poisoning can be uh, broadly thought of as occurring in different phases. And again, time course is a very important thing to appreciate here. So you have a delayed onset of signs and symptoms. 
Uh, so signs and symptoms don't begin for about 6 to 24 hours following ingestion, right? So you will ingest the mushroom and you won't have initial signs and symptoms. And then the initial signs and symptoms are going to be rather nonspecific and include things like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. You might even get some blood in the stool, right? So these are fairly broad signs and symptoms and don't necessarily suggest a specific kind of poisoning. And then what happens at, is after about 12 to 48 hours, the patient enters a latent period where their, their, their initial signs and symptoms resolve and, and they don't feel terrible. They actually may feel much better. And then this gives way, after about 48 hours or so, to a third phase of organ failure. The abdominal pain returns. Uh, they tend to have end organ failure, uh, specifically the liver and kidneys um, are the uh, most uh, impacted organs and organ systems, and these patients can even develop seizures and death. So uh, fulminant uh, hepatic failure, uh, acute renal failure, and then subsequent chronic uh, liver and uh, renal failure are uh, very common causes of death following cyclopeptide or amanitin poisoning. So the general treatment is going to, in, in all, all cases of mycotoxicity, is really going to uh, be, is, is really going to stem from good supportive care, right? Opening the airway, ensuring the patients are breathing appropriately, um, managing their hemodynamic status, ensuring they have an adequate blood pressure, perfusing appropriately. So good supportive care. Um, if this is early on in the, in the tox toxicity, so... Uh, you are able to access this patient uh, you know, within the early stages, within, say, an hour or so of ingestion, and you have reason to believe that uh, this is the, the kind of mushroom involved, activated charcoal uh, may be helpful to reduce GI absorption and re decrease uh, concentrations of amanitin and, and attenuate uh, some of the end organ damage that can occur there. Again, aggressive support of fluid volume status, uh, is required. We need to be able to maintain renal perfusion. We need to be able to maintain adequate uh, urinary output uh, because renal failure is such a common uh, common problem following amanitin toxicity. Additional focus therapies. We, of course, we want to get a your standard tox toxicological labs. Work these patients up. Get a CBC. Get a blood chemistry. Uh, perhaps consider getting. Uh, toxic levels, say aspirin, acetaminophen, uh, if, if there is any, any doubt as to the potential substances involved. Uh, but it's also going to be important to get uh, clotting times. We want to get uh, coag, coag studies on the coagulation studies on these patients, particularly as the liver uh, begins to uh, dysfunction or increase liver dysfunction. It tends to manifest as um, a coagulopathy, and these patients are going to be more prone to developing uh, coagulopathies as they lose the ability to create uh, create adequate amounts of clotting factors. Um, so hepatic support is going to be important here. Uh, neomycin, yeah, that is the antibiotic. Neomycin um, is is protective and may play a role. A low protein diet to uh, decrease the load on the liver. Uh, vitamin K to uh, promote uh, coagulation, thymine, blood products may be uh, required such as um, fresh frozen plasma to replace uh, clotting factors and potentially a lactulose if the patient begins to develop a hepatic encephalopathy um, and of course that manifests as uh, elevated ammonia levels and lactulose may help um, transport um, excess ammonia out through the gut. A renal support may be important. Uh, again, we're going to be monitoring these uh, patients' blood chemistry, and as their their uh, renal uh, renal system takes a hit, we're going to see that manifest with an elevation in the BUN and creatinine, and uh, their urinary output may be impacted. Uh, so they may need good renal support. Uh, penicillin G may actually be protective for the kidneys in the, in the setting of uh, this toxicity. Uh, fluid therapy to maintain a renal perfusion. Uh, diuretics to promote renal output and uh, potentially even uh, renal replacement therapy or, or dialysis uh, with severe acute kidney injuries or acute uh, renal failure. And in some cases, in several cases of, of the amanitin toxicity, uh, liver and or a kidney transplant may be required.
And so the classic case study we talk about is the quote-unquote horse whisperer case study, and this involves uh, the author Nicholas Evans, who wrote the popular book that was subsequently adapted into a uh, movie uh, known as a horse whisperer. And in, in 2008, uh, this particular author and several members of his family uh, actually ingested what they believe were harmless mushrooms, and they turned out to be the Amanita filates death cap uh, mushrooms. Uh, they all subsequently developed acute renal failure, uh, with Nicholas Evans going on to actually develop chronic renal failure. And eventually, a couple of years later, in 2011, he actually had to uh, receive a transplanted kidney from one of his daughters. And so this is a, a real problem, and it's a, it's a real severe uh, mycodrome. Okay, moving on down to gyrometrin toxicity. So gyrometrin typically comes from the genus gyrometra. These are referred to as the false morel mushrooms, and they they kind of look like little brains. They have con a convolution. Their cap is kind of convoluted, and it looks like the uh, cerebral cortex of a brain. So it kind of has this uh, gyri sulci kind of appearance, and you you can see a little picture of a of a false morale there. And um, the problem with gyrometrin is if you ingest these false morales, the gyrometrin contained in them gets hydrolyzed or, or metabolized into monomethylhydrazine. And as we, we know, monomethylhydrazine is important because it blocks enzymes or a specific enzyme that interferes with vitamin B6 utilization. And vitamin B6 is an important cofactor in the GABA shunt, that's the gamma aminobutyric acid shunt, and remember you have uh, the GABA shunt within the brain that is important in uh, producing both GABA and glutamate, and remember GABA is the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, whereas glutamate is the, is the, um, the most important uh, excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system, and so what you get is if you inhibit the GABA shunt with hydrazine-like molecules, you will inhibit the body's ability to produce GABA, which means that you develop an excitoneurotoxicity where you have too much glutamate, the central nervous system becomes overexcited, and this tends to result in refractory seizures, seizures that will not necessarily respond to traditional therapies, so things like benzodiazepines, um, because as we know, benzodiazepines interact uh, through allosteric mechanisms with the uh, GABA, uh, the GABA receptors. Uh, they're not direct acting, but rather allosteric, and so you actually need to have adequate amounts of GABA for benzodiazepines to work. And so, in this setting, the seizures are life-threatening, and they're not well. They will not respond as as good as good as you'd like or as good as you'd expect with uh, traditional therapies involving benzodiazepines. Uh, so what's treatment going to revolve around? Well, treatment's really going to revolve around good supportive care, uh, as we talked about earlier, and then reactivating the GABA shunt in the classic medication that uh, we suggest being used is pyridoxine. It, pyridoxine given a 25 milligram per kilogram IV piggyback to reverse enzyme inhibition and allow for the production of GABA. And then once that occurs, then the seizure activity uh, can be a much easier, uh, treat, uh, treated much easier. Uh, in addition to this, we want to monitor renal hepatic function as gyrometrin toxicity can impact these organ systems as well. And these patients are also going to be at risk for met hemoglobinemia. Um, so we want to monitor and treat uh, that, and so that means that we would want to draw arterial blood gases and ensure that we are drawing uh, for a co-oximetry. Remember, a standard uh, arterial blood gas does not look at abnormal forms of hemoglobin, so we need to order co-oximetry if we want to detect abnormal forms of hemoglobin, and if met hemoglobinemia are substantial, Met hemoglobinemia occurs, then a methylene blue is uh, going to be the uh, anecdotal agent in that setting. Okay, moving on to the uh, next mycodrome, and this is uh, the caprine toxicity. So, uh, caprine typically comes from what are known as the inky cap mushrooms, um, and you can see a picture of the inky caps there, the caprinus 
Uh, the tox uh, toxicity, however, is very, very esoteric when it comes to coprine toxicity. And it is only going to occur with ethanol co-ingestion. And so what happens here is when you remember back to um, when you remember back to basic uh, pharmacology and you talked about metab the metabolism of, of really any alcohol or any any simple alcohol uh, hydrocarbon modified into an alcohol so uh, ethanol, ethylene glycol, propylene glycol, uh, so on and so forth, uh, there are some major enzymes, uh, enzyme systems involved in that. And um, of course, um, most alcohols initially are metabolized uh, via the uh, ADH, the alcohol dehydrogenase enzyme. And then the, the alcohol dehydrogenase in many cases, not all, particularly not when it, it comes to say like rubbing alcohol, for example, is isopropyl alcohol, um, but in most cases, uh, the alcohol is metabolized into an aldehyde, an aldehyde, an intermediate metabolite. Um, the common one is acetyl aldehyde, and that's what ethanol. So ethanol becomes meta is metabolized into acetyl aldehyde by um, alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, acetyl aldehyde is fairly toxic, right? It, it's very good at causing um, flushing nausea, vomiting, severe diarrhea, severe nausea and vomiting in some cases, chest pain, palpitations. It's very uncomfortable. It can cause dehydration and even like the retching can cause Mallory Weiss syndrome, uh, esophageal tears and, and, and things of that nature. So it can be pretty severe. Um, and so what happens is there is another enzyme called ALDH, that's aldehyde dehydrogenase. And so aldehyde dehydrogenase um, is responsible for metabolizing the aldehyde, uh, specifically the acetyl aldehyde in the case of ethanol or ETOH, into um, other metabolites. Um, and so what happens is with caprine toxicity, um, you actually inhibit the ALDH enzyme. Well, what does that do? Well, that prevents the body from breaking down or from metabolizing the acetylaldehyde um, intermediate metabolite that's produced when ethanol is metabolized into acetylaldehyde. Um, and so what happens is you have an accumulation of acetylaldehyde and this creates what's known as a disulfram-like reaction and this can last generally between two to four hours so it's fairly self-limiting if you can get the patient through the first couple of hours and, and you can treat their vomiting, you can you treat their dehydration if they develop it and give them good uh, supportive care. Um, and so, uh, of course, uh, there is um, this medication called disulfiram, which is also known as antabuse, which was developed as a way of treating or helping people uh, with alcohol addiction, alcohol addiction syndrome. And essentially, uh, it does the same thing as caprine. It blocks ALDH enzyme, and so when somebody ingests ethanol, they have a buildup of acetylaldehyde, which is uh, incredibly unpleasant. So that's why we say caprine toxicity presents with a with a um, with an antabuse like or a disulfiram like um, reaction. So the treatment is going to again revolve around good supportive care. If you have signs and symptoms of hypovolemia or hypotension, we're going to give a fluid therapy. Isotonic crystalloids tend to be the primary agents that we'd use, or you could go with a balanced uh, solution, such as plasma light as well, I suppose. Uh, Antiemetic therapy, monitor for dysrhythmias. Um, essentially, uh, it, what can happen with acetylaldehyde is you can get some beta effects, and these can result in tacky dysrhythmias. So think of you know, supra, supraventricular uh, rhythms can develop, uh, SVT, things of that nature, generally respond well to beta blockers if they develop. Okay, moving on to muscarin toxicity, and this comes from two genuses, two common genuses of um, uh, mushrooms, the anosope and clotosope mushrooms. And the anosope and clotosope mushrooms contain muscarin. And muscarin is a parasympathetic stimulating agent. So you essentially just think of a, a cholinergic or a parasympathomimetic toxidrome, right? 
Um, so due to the muscarinic and nicotinic agonism, right, because these are the primary receptors for acetylcholine, this is a a is fundamentally a problem with acetylcholine, too much acetylcholine. You get muscarinic and nicotinic agonism. The signs and symptoms of muscarin toxicity are similar to nerve agent toxicity, the cholinergic toxidrome, right? Uh, so what happens? Well, within about uh, half an hour to two hours, uh, the or, or rather, within about, um, yeah, with about 30 minutes to an hour or so, signs and symptoms begin, and they typically resolve within a couple of hours. So it's a fairly rapid onset, fairly limited duration of action with this particular toxidrome. Again, do not confuse muscarin with muscamol, which is something we're going to talk about next. Very different kinds of uh, mycodromes. This fundamentally is a cholinergic toxidrome, right? Think of sludge and think of the killer bees here. So what's the treatment? Again, good supportive care, fluids for hypotension. If the patient develops a bronchospasm, short-acting beta agonists such as albuterol are going to be helpful. And then um, primarily, the primarily anecdotal treatment is going to be atropine to control the cholinergic signs and symptoms. And again, Within a couple of hours, these patients should start to improve. All right, the next mycodrome is ibotenic acid, muscimol toxicity. Again, not the same thing as muscarin. Very different, right? And the muscimol is the agent that is classically found in the classic Amanita muscaria, which is um, the red mushroom with white scales on top of it there and there's a picture for you to reference. The well-known Amanita muscaria mushroom, also known as the fly ergot, and I believe that, that the story goes that a fly lands on it and then it dies when it lands on the mushroom, and uh, I believe that's uh, one of the stories where the term fly ergot comes from. It's a common mushroom associated with muscle mold toxicity. Um, in fact, there is another type of mushroom that's in the same uh, genus, but it's a different species from the muscaria, known as the Amanita pantheria, or pantherina, excuse me. These are known as the panther mushrooms. The Amanita pantherina actually contain a lot more muscimol um, than uh, the Amanita muscaria. So uh, the the, Am the Amanita pantherina, or the panther mushrooms, are actually uh, well, typically a much more toxic because they have uh, higher concentrations of uh, the mycotoxin uh, than the Amanita muscaria. But be that as it may, ibotenic acid and muscimol are the problems that we worry about. Uh, ibotenic acid is less active, and it's actually a prodrug of muscimol, so ibotenic acid gets converted to uh, muscimol um, following ingestion. So some mushrooms may have more ibotenic acid, so they're going to be a little less toxic, and some are going to have more muscimol, uh, so they tend to be a little more uh, more toxic. Uh, in general, dried mushrooms are more potent, and muscimol can actually be excreted um, as as its its as its its own metabolite in the urine. So uh, sometimes, what happens, in, I believe, in a shamanic context, is um, there are some areas of the world where people may ingest the mushrooms. Uh, ibotenic acid containing mushrooms and then uh, what following ingestion they will collect their urine and the ibotenic acid will have been converted to muscimol and so the urine is actually more potent than the parent mushroom and so I believe there are some cases of people using or ingesting the urine because the urine produces a more potent effect than the, the parent mushroom just kind of an interesting aside uh, so, what are the signs and symptoms of ibotenic acid and muscimol? Well, ibotenic acid and muscimol agonize GABA-A receptors. You remember there are two major groups of receptors for GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA-A and GABA-B. These particular agents agonize GABA-A receptors, and this tends to result in um, hallucinations, sedation, uh, lucid dreamlike states, Overall, you can have uh, central nervous system depression, you can have a very deep sleep that can occur, you can have ataxia, so the so-called ataxic or quote-unquote drunk walk gait. 
Um, and in some cases, these patients may actually develop severe anxiety, agitation, and uh, very rarely uh, even seizures may develop. Um, so these mushrooms are sometimes consumed in a ceremonial or recreational context for their hallucinogenic properties. Um, the onset varies, really varies according to the, the, how the mushroom's used. Generally speaking, if you ingest it, it's going to take about 30 to 60 minutes. This tends to be the classic way that we, we, we see this type of exposure. Um, however, it can be smoked, and as you might imagine, the onset's going to be very rapid if it's smoked. Um, the effects of muscomol to toxicity can last up to several hours, you know, anywhere from five to eight hours. So what's the treatment? Good supportive care. If the patients uh, develop seizures, benzodiazepines may be helpful, um, particularly if they have seizures and or extreme agitation. Again, do not confuse this with muscarin toxicity. And in fact, atropine would be contraindicated in these patients, right? So muscomol is not the same thing as muscarin. Okay, moving right on along to psilocybin exposure. So this is not a classic, what I would consider uh, a mycodrome, um, in that psilocybin is not particularly toxic in a physical sense, right? It doesn't tend to cause organ failure, it doesn't tend to cause seizures, doesn't tend to impact hemodynamics substantially, but rather, the problems that we run into with psilocybin, uh, one, tend to be fairly rare, but are going to be more psychological in, in nature. So psilocybin is a psychoactive agent. It's actually a prodrug of something called psilocin. So psilocybin gets metabolized into its active metabolite psilocin in the body. And um, uh, Psilocybin primarily comes from three genuses of mushroom, with uh, psilocybe being probably the most common in, in worldwide, I, I would say uh, psilocybe cubensis, the cubensis mushrooms are going to be probably the most commonly encountered way that we get psilocybe. But again, several, several kinds of mushrooms uh, produce uh, psilocybe, not just the cubensis, but cubensis is a classic one that grows out of cow cow patties in the Pacific Northwest, and so it's the picture that I put there because it is such a classic example of a psilocybin-containing um, fungi or fungus. So uh, again, what's the problem with psilocybin or psilocin? Well, it's chemically, structurally, it's very similar to serotonin or 5-hydroxytryptamine, and it acts like many other agents that agonize 5-hydroxytryptamine uh, receptors or 5-HT receptors. Um, and these include agents uh, such as uh, L-sergic acid diethylamide or LSD, NN uh, dimethyltryptamine or DMT, um, and other agents like that. Um, the primary effects seem to revolve around agonizing the 5-hydroxytryptamine 2A or the 5-HT2A receptor. This is definitely a necessary, a necessary but insufficient component to how these particular agents work. Um, these are commonly used in either a recreational or, or sometimes a ceremonial uh, context. So again, history and physical is so important. Figure out what the context of the, the mushroom ingestion was. Uh, so the signs and symptoms of psilocybin tend to be dose dependent. Uh, they tend to take about 30 minutes or so to begin. So signs and symptoms begin at about 30 minutes following ingestion and last oh, anywhere from 4 to 6 hours. Uh, the main signs and symptoms include an alteration in sensorium, hallucinations, visual disturbances, occasionally terror uh, can occur, euphoria. Sometimes uh, nausea and vomiting can be associated with psilocybin exposure as well. Um, the effects tend to be dose dependent and to, uh, the more pronounced signs and symptoms are going to occur at larger larger doses. Uh, typically, this particular mycodrome is not life-threatening. However, patients can feel as though they are dead or dying and this is sometimes referred to as ego death or ego death uh, by proxy and so these patients can develop a lot of anxiety, even terror, and so the main issues are going to revolve around anxiety and agitation. There are some rare 
life-threatening complications associated with psilocybin exposure, and this is um, typically if the psilocybin is co-ingested with other agents that increase serotonin activity, or called, so-called serotonergic agents, and the classic ones are the the um, antidepressants, and these can include uh, SSRIs, or the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the tricyclic antidepressants, and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the MAOIs. Co-ingestion of uh, psilocybin with these agents can increase the risk of something called serotonin syndrome. It's fairly rare, but it can occur where these patients develop um, a very high temperature and excitotoxicity, and it can potentially be life-threatening. Um, in general, however, the treatment's going to really revolve around good supportive care, providing a quiet, relaxed setting for these patients, kind of helping them out, just being there for them. Um, if they're incredibly agitated, uh, having severe anxiety, really hard to manage, benzodiazepines may be helpful. If they develop serotonin syndrome, active cooling may be needed to get their core temperature down. And potentially serotonin blocking agents as, as cyperheptidine um, may be indicated to treat the, the uh, serotonin syndrome that can occur. Again, this is a fairly rare uh, manifestation in this mycodrome. All right, and then the last one is the uh, multiple mushrooms that cause gastrointestinal irritation. This is actually the most common form of mushroom poisoning. The problem is many of the life-threatening toxidromes can initially present with gastrointestinal irritation. Um, so it can be hard to differentiate, and so that's why if somebody presents with gastrointestinal signs and symptoms following a possible mushroom ingestion, it's probably going to be good to monitor these patients um, in some sort of monitored setting for several hours because the time course of these mycodromes is very important. Um, many types of mushrooms, typically what happens is you get a gastrointestinal illness that is self-limiting. Uh, within about 24 hours it resolves and classically we see nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Your typical onset is going to be within a couple hours of ingestion and we essentially are going to treat this as gastroenteritis. Right? Occasionally, um, there are uh, certain species of mushrooms that can cause a more severe gastrointestinal um, pro, uh, gastrointestinal um, toxidrome, um, and these include the uh, green spored uh, false parasol mushrooms, and I have a picture of those there, the um, chlorophyllium molybdites, also known as the green spored false parasol um, and they actually produce little green spores, and you see the greenish coloration in the gills there in that picture. And this uh, it tends to be a much more severe uh, gastroenteritis that can develop, and so these patients uh, um, are going to be maybe treated a little more aggressively. But again, um, it's going to be self-limiting within a couple of days. As long as you can do good supportive care, keep, uh, keep their blood pressure up, give them antiemetics, watch them, they tend to do okay. Okay, so in summary, there are seven mycodromes, seven uh, substantial mycodromes that we run into. We've got the cyclopeptides, the amanidin, and this results in a delayed toxicity uh, primarily involving kidney and liver dysfunction. All right, then you have a hydrazine, right? Toxicity, essentially this is hydrazine toxicity and this d results in seizures and delayed organ toxicity. You have coprine toxicity. This results in a disulfiram-like uh, reaction. It is only a problem with ethanol co-ingestion. Then you have a muscarin toxicity, um, and this is essentially a cholinergic toxidrome. Then you have ibotenic acid and muscimol toxicity, um, and this involves the GABA-A agonism. So these patients appear intoxicated. They have ataxia, hallucinations, altered mental status. You've got psilocybin, which is a hallucinogenic or so-called magic mushrooms. And then you've got gastrointestinal irritation. And those are the seven mycodromes. And with that, I'll move on to the references. Here are my references for the uh, pictures that I used. Again, all these pictures fall under a Creative Commons uh, license and are used in a non-monetized 
and an educational context only. And then I do have a link, or rather uh, the journal that was um, the the journal that I referenced, um, which I suggest you all take a look at if you're interested in mycotoxicity, and that is Clinical Approach to Toxic Mushroom Poisoning in the Journal of the American Board of Family Practice. And it was published in January 1994, so 20, 25 plus years ago, but I still think that it is a very relevant read even today. And uh, with that, I think we are done, and I hope that you guys enjoyed this presentation. I hope you got something out of it. I find it fascinating, if not kind of interesting and esoteric. All right. I hope you guys have a great time, and if you were listening to this around the time that um, I upload it, then I and you are living in the United States of America, then I uh, also wish you a happy Thanksgiving as well. And with that, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.